the practice of Dharma has its values. You will encounter some forms of meditation that have tried to strip all the values away, but they're pretty minimalist. And really don't go that deep. For the practice to go deep, you realize there are values underlying the practice, a sense of priorities about what's really important in life and what has to be put aside. Because as the Buddha said, there are many kinds of happiness, but there are some kinds of happiness that can be attained only by abandoning other kinds of happiness. And so you have to make your choice. Where are you going to look for pleasure in life? What kind of pleasures, what kind of happiness are you going to look for? What are the things that have to be sacrificed? And what are the things that you sacrifice for? This point becomes especially clear when you're trying to meditate at home, living a householder life. It's not simply a question of trying to find the time to meditate, but it's also protecting the values of the practice in an environment that may not necessarily be all that conducive, that's pushing other values at you. That's the difficult part of practice at home. It's maintaining your priorities. In other words, realizing that the training of the mind is the number one issue in life. And that has to be your bottom line. Out in the world, the bottom line is how you make money, how much money you make. You've got to make enough to survive. But then our question of how much is enough gets really distorted. I mean, there are whole industries out there that are devoted to distorting your idea of how much is enough. And there are times when you have to be willing to take a hit in your income if you're really going to practice the Dharma. John Cha has a nice simile. He says that wealth that's gained through dishonest means or means that go against the Dharma is not really wealth. And there's a lot to it. It's just like a lot of gravel. Wealth that's gained through Honest means it's gained through the practice, sticking with the precepts, sticking with the principles of life, right livelihood. That's genuine wealth, even though it may be small. It's like small diamonds, small bits of gold. It really does have value. Now you're not going to hear that much in, in the world out there, but you have to remember if you took the values of the world out there to their logical extreme, there'd be nothing but oppression, taking advantage of one another. He has another interesting simile. He says, it's, suppose once everybody decides that wealth is the important thing in life, no matter how you get it, then it's possible that someone someday might decide that human skin could fetch a price. You could use skin to make all kinds of interesting things. And they said there'd be nothing to say no, and everybody would be killing one another over their skins just to fetch skins that take to sell in the market. In other words, you have to have other values that counteract the dominant values out there. You have to learn how to hold on to them. This is why we have Dharma talks that you listen to, Dharma books to read. So even if you're far from a Dharma community, you have a lifeline. There's a connection. At the same time, though, it's, it's important to realize that there are some positive values to living with other people. And this applies not only in lay life, but also here at the monastery. There's that famous passage where the Buddha says, by helping yourself, you're helping others. But then he goes on to say, by helping others, you help yourself. And how do you help yourself when you help others? There are four qualities that you want to be working on and helping one another. The first one is endurance. You learn to put up with things that are difficult. You learn to put up with restrictions that cannot be changed. 
And that doesn't mean you allow them to defeat you. It simply means you realize, okay, what cannot be changed, you've got to work around that. And the amount of effort that goes into helping other people. That's one of the perfections. The endurance, the effort, all, those are both perfections. So when you find that situations are difficult and asking more out of you than you would like to give, especially in terms of your energy and time, remember that by giving that extra amount, you're stretching yourself. You're making yourself grow. Because those powers of endurance can then be used to be applied to the practice. The second principle that you get good training in is harmlessness. You decide that in your dealings with other people you're not going to harm anybody. You're not going to break the precepts as you deal with them. You're going to treat them fairly. Look for your livelihood in an honest way. And this is false not only your dealings with other people, but with all the, all the pests and other animals that you're going to encounter. Years back we were having a discussion up in Laguna Beach, and I got around to the precepts, and pretty soon we were talking about how to deal with ants. And someone made a sarcastic remark, well, this is, going to be, this is a really deep Dharma discussion we're having tonight about ants. And I said, look, if you can't learn how to treat an ant harmlessly, how can you trust yourself to treat other people harmlessly? How can you trust yourself to treat yourself harmlessly? Because the things that happen in the mind are smaller even than ants, and it's a good lesson that whatever you're going to do, you're not going to harm anybody. You're not going to harm yourself. And figuring that one out when you're dealing with the back and forth of lay life is a really good test of your discernment. And there are two states of mind that are developed. One is a mind of goodwill, and the other is a mind of empathy. And they're not quite the same. Goodwill is a basic wish for happiness for all beings, yourself and for others. Empathy is when you learn how to empathize with someone else's idea of what's happiness. And it may be foreign to yours, but you learn to see things from another person's perspective. And opening yourself up that way, that develops important qualities of the mind. So those are the four positive things that come from practicing the Dharma with other people, engaging with other people, whether it's at home or at the monastery, so that you realize that the time that you spend, say here at the monastery working on the chores, the time you spend at home working on your livelihood, being with your family. It's all part of Dharma practice. We've had people come here and complain that they got less time to meditate here than they would, say, at a meditation retreat, or there's nothing but meditation. But again, that's a very narrow slice of the practice, what you do when you sit with your eyes closed, what you do when you're doing walking meditation. It's engaging with other people that you develop some really important qualities. I know in my own case, looking after John Fuang when he was sick taught me a lot of Dharma that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. Because he tended to fall sick at inconvenient times. I'd have other projects going at the monastery, and whoops, couldn't work on that. Now I have to look after him. Stay up late, late, late at night. And he tended to be really strict with you when he was sick. So dealing with whatever unskillful thoughts are coming up in my mind, just learning how to just put them out of my mind and do what needed to be done. All these things were really good lessons in the Dharma. And you don't get them when you're just sitting with your eyes closed on a retreat. Or think that your Dharma practice at home is simply the time that you get to sit and meditate. It's all Dharma practice, if you make it Dharma practice. And focus on these four qualities in your relationships. 
that you're going to develop endurance, you're going to develop the, the ability to be harmless, you're going to develop a mind of goodwill and a mind of empathy. That's how, in helping others, you help yourself. <laughs>